In accordance with Standing Order 43, the time for members' statements has concluded. The Deputy Prime Minister, Acting Prime Minister, on Thank with uh, ministerial arrangements. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I inform the House that the Prime Minister will be absent from question time today, as he is leading a delegation to the United States of America. And I will answer questions on his behalf. The Assistant Defence Minister and Minister for International Development and the Pacific will be absent from question time today, as he is representing Australia at the official funeral of the late former Prime Minister of Tonga. The Minister for Home Affairs will answer questions on his behalf. The Minister for Veterans Affairs uh, and Defence Personnel will be absent from question time today, as he is representing Australia in Timor-Leste. The Minister for Home Affairs will answer questions on his behalf. Mr. Speaker. The Acting Prime Minister uh, has indicated to me as a statement on indulgence. The Acting Prime Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. On indulgence, the government welcomes this year's joint recipients of the Bravery Award. Officers Mark Turner and Linda Farrand from the Northern Territory Police Service. They have gone above and beyond in their everyday duties. They have put their lives on the line to protect a member of the community. They have demonstrated exceptional acts in exceptional circumstances. On behalf of all Australians, thank you for what you have done and what you will continue to do to protect our people, our communities. Today is National Thank a Cop Day. And, uh, Mr Speaker, on indulgence, I would like to acknowledge uh, all uh, serving and former police officers and those who have worn a uniform in any capacity. And, uh, I would like to also acknowledge uh, those uh, former police officers who serve in our House of Representatives, uh, including the member for Cowper, Dixon, Wide Bay, Latrobe, and Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And on indulgence, the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I join with the Acting Prime Minister in acknowledging these great Australians who are with us in the gallery today. I had the opportunity earlier today to meet with Mark Turner and Linda Farrand and uh, to congratulate them personally on this wonderful achievement. People who put their lives on the line to save someone who felt that living was not an option. Can I say to them that, that your patience, your compassion and your sheer courage through that longest of nights saved a life? You embody not just the highest values that you can aspire to as police officers, but the highest values any of us can aspire to as human beings. I join with the Acting Prime Minister in uh, celebrating all of those who serve in our police forces around the nation and indeed also in our Australian Federal Police. Uh, we are about to celebrate the 30th uh, anniversary of Police Commemoration Day, remembering those who have lost their lives in the service of others. And we acknowledge the families who have been left behind and their friends. Uh, it is a great decision, anyone who makes a decision to go into our police forces, uh, to live a life that is about assisting others. And I pay tribute to each and every man and woman who is doing that today. And I join with the Acting Prime Minister in acknowledging the members of this House who have served as police officers in the past and have gone on to a far more gentle duty uh, in this chamber, uh, but uh, anyone who makes this decision is worthy of the thanks of the community. And on behalf of the Australian Labor Party, I join with the Acting Prime Minister to ensure that all those who serve know that this is an absolutely bipartisan commitment, indeed a commitment on behalf of every member of this House. And, uh let me associate myself with the remarks of the Acting Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition. And uh, to Mike and Linda, who are with us today, uh, Mark and Linda, who are with us today, thank you uh, so much for your service and for your bravery. Yeah. Questions without notice? I think we know the member for Rankin has the first question. Member for Rankin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. What is the value of the underspend? on the National Disability Insurance Scheme 
in the final budget outcome. The <coughs> just, just if Minister might wait, I haven't called him yet. Members on my left will cease interjecting. The Minister for the NDIS has the call. Let me thank the Shadow Minister for his question. As he knows today, in the final budget update, the actual number for the NDIS was a spend of $8.5 billion. The great thing to remember about the NDIS, if we look at actually cost per participant, in the 18-19 budget it was estimated an expenditure of $46,000 $400 per participant. The actual amount spent per participant on supports was $46,800, a $400 increase. Not a single participant has seen a decrease. So the way we explain the, the underspend, I'm getting to it. I'm getting the underspend. The underspend figure of $4.6 billion can be explained as follows. When the bilateral estimates were put together, the bilateral estimate said there'd be 302,172 Australians. Those bilateral Can estimates came from the states second. and territories. Can a minister please pause? Minister doesn't have the call. I'm just going to say to the member for Rankin and the Treasurer, please cease interjecting. I'm expected to hear the answer. And the minister is not answering the question quietly, can I say, and it's still very difficult to hear. The minister has the call. This is very noisy, Mr Speaker. The bilateral estimates had 302,000 expected citizens, but once the data arrived from the states and territories, only 199,000 citizens could be found. 100,000 people of data provided from the states and territories have not able to be found or have been double counted or frankly the data is wrong 100,000 however on top of that the bilateral estimate said that 69,195 new participants would come through in actuality 117,000 new participants have sought access a 169% increase 169 per cent increase of new participants have come through. And how is it that we have been able to fund, fund for this Griffith demand driven scheme? An uncapped demand driven scheme, the only way we have been able to fund it, not last year, not just this year, but for every year going forward, $17.8 billion this year, growing to $25 billion in 2022-23. The only reason we can fund it going forward is because this government, led by this Treasurer, has actually balanced the budget. Today's Member announcement was about balancing the budget. For the first time in a long time, 11 years, precipitated by those opposite, the budget is balanced this year and next year and the following years going forward. This government will not be lectured by those opposite when it comes to fiscal discipline and how we fund services. The member for Morton will cease interjecting. Can he refer back to everything I've said during the week? And no, no, don't talk. That's the point. <laughs> That's the point. Okay. Well, I've been warning you all week, so. You know what will you know happen. The member for Dawson has well, thank the Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister, the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. Uh, will the Acting Prime Minister inform the House how the Morrison-McCormick government is delivering stability and certainty for communities in regional Australia who are suffering through the drought? The Acting Prime Minister has the call. Yeah, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Dawson for his question. He knows that there are farmers out there who are suffering, who are experiencing from the, their worst drought on record, Mr Speaker. And I encourage every member of the House to visit a drought-inflicted community to see firsthand the impact that it is having. Uh, Mr Speaker, next month the government will launch the National Water Grid Authority. 
Drought is something that we should not ever play politics on. The authority is designed to do just that. Uh, it's a specialist body which will use the world's best minds, but importantly with local stakeholder engagement. And that's significant, Mr Speaker, because when you've got uh, people like we have in the granite built area of Queensland, Mr Speaker, who are willing to back themselves, willing to take that risk and invest $24.3 million into a water storage infrastructure project, that is the Emu Swamp Dam, then governments, both state and federal level, should follow up that support, that investment in themselves. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. We've put $42 million on the table for that, another, another uh, $5 million for enabling roads, Mr Speaker. And pleased that the Queensland government has come up to the, uh, with the tune of uh, $18 million as well. Mr Speaker, this will provide a 12,000 megalitre rock fill clay core dam on the Severn River near Stanthorpe in the member for Maranoa's electorate. Mr. Speaker. It will include three pump stations and a 117 kilometre pump pipeline distribution network. And it's going to inject almost $70 million into the local economy. But most importantly, it will, will provide security and uh, certainty for our farmers. Mr. Speaker. We want to see shovels in the ground very soon on that project. And I know that uh, the National Water Grid Authority is going to make such a difference. But we're already making a big difference in the area of water security. The Mile Up Wellington project in Western Australia, backed by this government, Mr Speaker. We're already building and it will uh, be completed uh, this year, all things being equal, the Scottsdale irrigation scheme in Tasmania. South West Loddon pipeline in Victoria. I talked the other day about the Midiamo uh, pipeline in Victoria as well. And the Northern Adelaide irrigation scheme in South Australia, where Penfield grower Daniel Hoffman told me that this investment means that some farms will save up to $60,000 per year. That's just on water. Previously, we could, uh, could uh, never afford to water into the summer. This means we can grow produce all year round. This is making such a difference for rural and regional Australia, particularly communities affected by drought. Uh, the Liberals and Nationals are delivering stability and certainty when it comes to the 8 million Australians who live in rural and regional Australia, who back themselves every day. And we're backing them as well. We're backing them through this drought. We're backing them for a better future. And we're doing it each and every day, Mr Speaker. It's good policy. <coughs> the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. And I refer to the Minister's previous answer about demand in the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Is the government seriously suggesting that Australians with a disability aren't out there waiting for care packages? And is the government seriously suggesting the National Disability Insurance Scheme can adequately meet demand with a $4.6 billion underspend? The Acting Prime Minister has the call. Oh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Funding for the NDIS is guaranteed, Mr Absolutely. Speaker. No Australian, no Australian who is eligible for the NDIS will miss out. No Australian will miss out. And I, and I commend Can the uh, Minister for Prime what Minister, he is doing. Acting Prime Minister, just pause for a second. The member for Griffith will leave under 94A. The Acting Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. We are strongly committed to the NDIS, as I said, and as the Minister said in the first question in question time today. It is one of the most important social and economic reforms in our country's history. And, Mr Speaker, I'm proud to say that, uh, that when this reform was uh, suggested by Prime Minister Gillard, who is, who is actually in the House today, and I saw her this morning and I commended for the work that she is doing uh, with Beyond Blue and other organisations in her post-political career, Mr Speaker. Uh, she has been a class act. I have to say, and this is this was good good reform, Mr. Speaker. I was proud to say that uh, I was the first New South Wales federal parliamentarian to sign up to the Everyone Counts uh, campaign, which was uh, uh, happened at the time that the NDIS was first mooted, Mr. Speaker. Now, for the ma vast majority of the more than 300,000 participants, the NDIS is delivering improved levels of supports and more choice and control. Uh, over 100,000 people are receiving disability support services for the first time ever. So it's, it's good policy reform, Mr Speaker, but I have to say, I have to say that when those, that when those <coughs> introduced this legislation, they didn't put this, the, the amount of money towards the NDIS that was, that was required. Guys. Mr Speaker, we are, funding, we are funding the reform, we are backing the NDIS, and again, Mr Speaker, I say that funding for the NDIS is guaranteed. 
The member for Goldstein. Thank you, Speaker. <coughs> Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer inform the House how the Morrison McCormack government, stable and certain budgetary environment and management, is guaranteeing essential services that Australians rely on? And is he aware of alternative approaches? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member for Goldstein for his question. And he chairs the House Economics Committee and he understands the importance of strong economic management. And he shone a light on Labor's retirees tax and the damaging impact that it would have on retired Australians now. Now, Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to inform the House that the budget is in balance for the first yeah. time in 11 years, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Yeah. Hey, hey. With a deficit of $690 million, which is equivalent to 0.0 per cent of GDP, Mr. Speaker. A $13.8 billion improvement on what was forecast when the budget was first handed down in May 2018, Mr. Speaker, and a three and a half billion dollar improvement on what was announced in April of this year, Mr. Speaker. Now, the benefit of having responsible economic management is that you can fund and provide the services that Australians need and deserve, like record. $80 billion of funding for health, Mr. Speaker, like record $20 billion of funding for schools, Mr. Speaker, like record $19.8 billion for aged care, Mr. Speaker, and like a doubling on the year prior of $8.5 billion for the NDIS, which the Labor Party never funded, Mr. Speaker. That is the reality of strong economic management. Now I'm asked, are there any alternative approaches? Well, let me tell you, the Labor Party had policies that delivered accumulated deficits of $240 billion. The Labor Party had policies that delivered in their last three financial budget outcomes a $70 billion deterioration in the bottom line, Mr Speaker. The Labor Party had policies that, even with a $180 iron ore price, could not deliver the four budget surpluses that Chairman Swan promised the Australian people, Mr. Speaker. And the Labor Party had policies that meant they couldn't afford to list drugs Member on the Gordon. PBS because fiscal circumstances didn't permit. The reality that the Australian people know all too well is that the Labor Party can't manage money, and the Coalition can manage money, and the Coalition can create jobs, and the Coalition can reduce taxes for all hard-working Australians. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Uh, will the Treasurer admit that the government's decision to understaff the National Disability Insurance Scheme is preventing Australians with a disability getting the care they need? Why has the government propped up its budget by deliberately underspending $4.6 billion on the National Disability Insurance Scheme? The Treasurer has the call. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I can confirm that there are 11,000 people helping to deliver the NDIS, and in the last year, 115,000 Australians came onto the NDIS, Mr. Speaker. There are now 300,000 Australians who are on the NDIS, and as the Acting Prime Minister said, more than 100,000 of them are getting support for the first time, Mr. Speaker. The reality is, the NDIS has increased tenfold in the three years of transition, Mr. Speaker, and everyone who has approved program is getting support under a fully funded NDIS. Now, Mr. Speaker, in 2018-19, we doubled the, the funding and the spending on the NDIS to eight and a half billion dollars from the four billion dollars a year prior. Mr Speaker, the Labor Party knows all too well that only the coalition 
can deliver budget surpluses, only the Coalition can fund the services like the NDIS that Australians need and deserve. The member for Mayo. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Environment. The Australian Walking Company has state government approval to build accommodation within the Flinders Chase National Park on Kangaroo Island. Development will clear several kilometres of remnant native vegetation in the national park. In your letter to me, dated 9 September 2019, you advise that on the direct advice of the developer, you will not review the proposal despite broad community concerns of environmental damage. Minister, why are you only listening to the developer and not my community? And would you please reconsider investigating this proposal with respect to potential environmental damage in our national park? Good question. The Minister for the Environment. Well, I thank the member for Mayo for her question, and she's a frequent correspondent to me on matters of concern to her in her electorate of Mayo. And I'm always very happy, my door is always open for her to have further detailed conversations about matters such as this. The matter to which she refers relates to an application for development which was deemed not to be controlled under the federal government's EPBC Act. Now, the process and methodology whereby actions are referred is well understood, long standing, and I know that the member for Mayo understands it well. I want to make the point, Mr Speaker, through you to the member for Mayo, that state governments have completely different approval processes. Mm -hmm. and Sometimes people confuse the two, and reasons why they may not want to see a development are actually not matters of national environmental significance under federal law, but they relate to some totally different set of arrangements and approvals that belong in the state jurisdiction. Having said that, I have conversed with my South Australian colleagues about this application, and I'm very comfortable that we are on the same page, and I'm very comfortable with the position that this government has taken, standing behind the current EPBC Act on this matter. The member for Boothby. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer explain to the House how the Morrison McCormack government's record of creating jobs? has helped provide stability and certainty to the budget, allowing us to deliver the essential services that Australians rely upon. Is the there any alternative policies? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Boothby for her question. And she brings to this place experience in industry, experience in the media, and experience defeating a nasty campaign from Get Up, Mr Speaker. And she adds, a campaign which was backed and supported all the way by the Labor Party, Mr. Speaker. Now the reality is, when we came to government, unemployment was at 5.7%, Mr. Speaker. Employment growth was at 0.7%, Mr. Speaker. The participation rate was lower than it is today, Mr. Speaker, and the gender pay gap was wider than it is today, Mr. Speaker. But today. The Coalition is Member proud to tell is this House and the Australian people that the budget is back in the balance for the first time in 11 years, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker. And 300,000 people got a job in 2018-19, Mr Speaker. 100,000 more than was already uh, expected, Mr Speaker, by Treasury. This led to an increase in our receipts and a decrease in payment as more people were in a job and less people were on welfare, Mr Speaker. And the benefit of having a balanced budget is that you can deliver the services that people need and deserve, <coughs> like the NDIS, Mr Speaker. And in the, in the jobs numbers that are out today, Mr Speaker, 35,000 people got a job in the month of August, Mr Speaker. 36,000 people got a job in the month of July. That means since we got re-elected by the Australian people, more than 1,000 jobs have been created a day, Mr Speaker. Now, I'm asked, am I aware of any alternative policies? Well, the Labor Party still has $387 billion 
of higher taxes on their books, Mr. Speaker. You don't balance budgets. You don't create budget surpluses. You don't create jobs with higher taxes, Mr. Speaker. High taxes on superannuants. High taxes on retirees. High taxes on homeowners. High taxes on renters. Higher taxes on workers, including those in Gladstone that the member for Maribyrnong confronted during the election, Mr. Speaker. Now, Paul Keating had it right when he said the Labor Party has lost the ability to speak to the aspirations of Australians, Mr. Speaker. Yep. Paul Keating had it right when he said the Labor Party of today has lost the ability to fashion policies that speak to the aspirations of the Australian people. Mr Speaker, only the coalition can manage the budget, only the coalition can create more jobs and only the coalition can lower taxes for all hard-working Australians. The member for Maribyrnong. And my question is to the Treasurer. I refer to nine-year-old Angus, whose family were left to transport him around the family farm in a wheelbarrow because the National Disability Insurance Scheme could not approve and provide him with a wheelchair for 12 months. Isn't Angus just one victim of the government's $4.6 billion underspend on the National Disability Insurance Scheme? The Treasurer has the call. Mr Speaker, the member for Maribyrnong would be aware that in 2017-18 there was $4 billion spent on the NDIS. The member for Maribyrnong would be aware that in 2018 19, eight and a half billion dollars was spent on the NDIS. The member for Maribyrnong would be aware. Excuse me. The member for Maribyrnong would be aware that everybody who has an approved program within the NDIS is fully funded by this government, Mr. Speaker. And the member for Maribyrnong would be aware that there are now 300,000 people in the NDIS, over 100,000 of whom are getting support for the first time as Speaker. 115,000 people member for Lola. came on to the NDIS in the last year alone. Now, the member for Maribyrnong would also be aware, as a former leader of the opposition, just like the member for Rankin would know when he was learning at the feet of Chairman Swan, Mr. Speaker, that the NDIS is a demand-driven program, Mr. Speaker. Just like just like hospitals are, Mr Speaker, and as I announced in April of this year, an extra $1.9 billion for hospital funding because of the demand. Just like the PBS, Mr Speaker, and in the numbers that were announced today, an extra $700 million for the PBS because it's a demand-driven program. But what is an inconvenient truth for the Labor Party is that in their last budget, they had underspends of $500 million for carers and $400 million for veterans, Mr. Speaker. In their last MyEFO, they had underspends of $1.5 billion for schools and $1.5 billion for hospitals, Mr. Speaker. The reality is the NDIS funding has more than doubled, more than doubled on our watch, Mr. Speaker. It's rolling out to nearly 500,000 people and everyone who has an approved plan will get fully funded by this government. Just before I call the member for Robertson, I'd like to inform the House we also have present in the gallery this afternoon the South African High Commissioner. On behalf of the House, extend a very warm welcome to you. The member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. Will the minister update the House on how the Morrison-McCormack government's stable and certain approach is encouraging the study of STEM or science, technology, engineering and maths in schools to ensure that we have the skilled workforce our businesses need in the future, especially apprentices in regional Australia? The Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for her question. And like all of us on this side of the chamber, just, from, just I ask know the, the minister member to, to pause. The member for Gordon has been warned. The minister has the call. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and everyone on this side of the house here understands and recognises that the future of Australian industry depends on having the skilled workforce of the future.
Now, we understand that STEM skills will be required by about 75 per cent of the jobs of the future, and many apprenticeships and vocational education courses require significant STEM components and some STEM skills. This is particularly important in rural and regional yeah. Australia, where specialist mining, agriculture and space sector jobs are located. So the promotion of science and STEM, particularly in our rural and regional areas, is vital for our economy. So it was an absolute pleasure earlier this year to announce, alongside the member for Robertson, that the fun of science was going to be coming to Gosford and to Woi Woi. In her electorate, as part of the government's $8.9 million expansion of the Questacon Science Circus. And of course, Mr. Speaker, last week we celebrated Science Week with close to 2,000 events across the nation and over 1 million Australians participating. And I do acknowledge the great work of Questacon and the corporate sponsors who join with the government in backing Science Week, because we understand how important it is to make sure that everyone is inspired about science, and particularly our young people are inspired about science. Now, Mr Speaker, let me say this, that as a declared fan, I really want to point out that there has been a heightened interest in STEM as a result of Australia's current bachelor being an astrophysicist. Now, reports this week suggested that there had been a significant increase in inquiries about the study of science and that Google searches for astrophysicists had gone through the roof. Now, Mr Speaker, I'm all for popular culture that gets people talking about science. And I do note, Mr Speaker, that one of the finalists vying for the bachelor's heart in the finale tonight is in fact a chemical engineer. Yeah, yeah. So I say go Chelsea. Now, for the sake of Australian industry, Mr Speaker, and for jobs across our nation, and particularly for our jobs in rural and regional Australia. I encourage all young Australians to consider their STEM options. And as the bachelor said last night, science is sexy. The member for Rankin. Thanks very much, Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Why won't the Treasurer admit that today's budget outcome would not be possible without making Australians with a disability wait? for the care that they need and deserve and were promised so that he can add $4.6 billion to his budget bottom line. The Treasurer has the call. The member for Wright. The Treasurer has the call. Because the member for Rankin's claim is not true. The member for Gray. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health, and uh, let me thank him for having a wonderful visit to Gray only a couple of weeks ago. Will the minister update the House on how the Morrison McCormick government stable and certain budget enables critical investment in health services in rural and remote Australia, including in my electorate of Grey? The Minister for Health. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'm delighted, uh, along with the member for Grey, to be a member of the Morrison McCormack and Frydenberg government on the day. <laughs> on the day that the first balanced budget has been delivered in 11 years. And as the great Peter Costello said, every year of Labor government needs at least two years of coalition government to repair it. And we are only halfway there to repairing the damage, and then beyond that there's a lot more to be done. But most significantly, as the member for Gray indicates, and as we saw on the visit to his electorate, we have been able, because of a strong budget position, to invest in rural and regional health services. In a previous life, he was the head, he was the chair of the local Kimber Hospital. And uh, I was able to visit in Kimber with him at the hospital. And what we were able to see is the sort of thing that we are investing in as a government. In particular, one of the things which uh, many members of his community raised was the need for access to clinical trials in rural and regional Australia. Clinical trials that give us access to immunotherapies, 
uh, to breakthrough medicines such as uh, Spinraza for spinal muscular atrophy uh, or other extraordinary developments. And I am delighted that we will be able to deliver, because of the strength of the budget, a $100 million rural and regional clinical trials program. And that will go around the country, and that will give people in rural and regional Australia access to new medicines at an earlier time that they would otherwise never have been able to have accessed. In addition to that, there's a $63.4 million regional, uh, regional radiotherapy program. And that's about ensuring that in 13 sites across regional Australia, patients with cancer will have access to new radiotherapy, which would otherwise not have been within uh, the reach of their homes. And that will mean patients have better access, earlier treatment, and sometimes patients who might not have sought that treatment will be able to get it. It makes a profound and important difference. In addition to that, the investment in headspace around the country, with 30 new headspaces, will make a difference to young Australians in rural and regional Australia. We know that the Port Lincoln satellite uh, for headspace is coming on and builds on the opening last April of the Wyala headspace in the members' electorate. But this matters to people on all sides. It builds as well on what we're doing with men's sheds. Over a thousand med sheds, almost 80 per cent in regional Australia, making a difference to people who otherwise might not seek that help. All of these things are only possible because we have a strong budget, a budget that is back in balance and a budget that is on its way to surplus. Just before I call the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, I'd like to inform the House that we've just been joined uh, on the floor of the chamber this afternoon by members of the parliamentary delegation from the Japan Australia Diet Member League, and they're accompanied by the ambassador from Japan. A very warm welcome. And also present in the gallery uh, from Japan, we're joined by the 18th Australian Political Exchange Council visit. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to you all. Dep the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. What is the government's position on extending the so-called Big Stick legislation to supermarkets? The Acting Prime Minister. Well, I'll get the uh, Energy Minister to add to my remarks, but, uh, but I'll, I'll answer the, uh, the question from the Albanese Miles Fitzgibbon opposition and, uh, and, and just say this. The Big Stick legislation is important legislation. It is very important because what we want to do is make sure that we have the most reliable, affordable energy for Australians. And that's what we've always said and that's what we've certainly put in place. And that is why, uh, at large, energy prices are coming down. Under those opposite, Mr Speaker, I have to say that they couldn't even explain how much the energy costs were going to be for the average businesses, active, for average Acting families. Prime Minister will resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Yeah, um, and it goes to the issue of direct relevance as to whether someone can simply react to a trigger word or whether they have to deal with the context of the question at all. The context of the question is entirely about whether or not that legislation should apply to supermarkets, and the deputy prime minister is going, or the acting prime minister is going nowhere near that issue. The leader of the house. Well, Mr. Speaker, because there's no plan, the deputy prime minister is speaking to the only part of the question he can intelligibly speak to, which is the big stick legislation in relation to energy. I will just. I don't know what it is about a certain group of members that find, you know, it, the need to interject when both their manager of opposition business and the leader of the house have made points of order they're expecting me to rule on. No, I'm not just, I'll rule on the point of order first. Um, the question was very specific. It didn't um, contain a preamble. I was about to say to the Deputy Prime Minister, the Acting Prime Minister, yeah, of course he's entitled to a preamble on the issue, but uh, my, you know, I think that the scope, obviously, of a very specific question uh, is very limited in this respect. And the other thing I was going to say, I thought I heard um, the Acting Prime Minister say he would at some point refer it to the Energy Minister. There's a difficulty with that, unless he can convince me the Energy Minister is responsible for supermarkets. That's the problem. He can certainly refer it to a minister who has portfolio responsibility for that area. And um, 
that you know, obviously could be a number of ministers, but um, I think for the acting prime minister, he's been entitled to deal with um, deal with the energy policy point up until now, which he's done. But I think um, either he needs to go go to the specific part of the question, uh, or, or refer it, or. Um, or we can move on to the next question. The acting, the acting Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're taking on the energy companies. We make no apology for that. Yeah. The member for Gillespie, member for sorry, my friend, Mr. Gillespie, the member for Line. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. Will the Minister update the House on how the Morrison McCormack government is providing stability and certainty? for Australian families by holding energy companies to account to their customers? And is the minister aware of any alternate approaches? The Minister for Energy and Emissions Reductions. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you to the member for Lyon for his question. And he knows, as a hard-working regional MP, that we are absolutely focused on the stability and certainty that Australians need, Australian farmers need, in order to balance their budgets, to make ends meet, including in their small businesses. And he has many, many small businesses in his electorate of Lyon, Mr Speaker. Now, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, the importance of being able to make ends meet extends to ensuring we have fair deals on energy prices, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. A fair deal for all Australians, households, small businesses, and the industry that supplies so many jobs in electorates like uh, the members, Mr. Speaker. And that's why this week we have brought forward the big stick legislation, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, focused on the electricity industry, Mr. Speaker, on the electricity industry. Uh, and it's important because it ensures that the big energy companies pass on savings to their customers, Mr. Speaker. When there's savings in the wholesale market, they must pass those on to their customers, not pocketing the profits, Mr. Speaker. And it also ensures, it also ensures that the unacceptable and unsustainable profits uh, and the unacceptable and unsustainable conduct that has occurred in the industry comes to an end. It ensures that action can be taken against fraudulent manipulation and distortion of electricity markets, Mr. Speaker. But there are some risks, Mr. Speaker. There are some risks. Those opposite have voted against this legislation 13 times in the previous parliament. They voted against lower electricity prices 13 times in the previous parliament, Mr. Speaker. But now, now they're all over the place. Are they for the 45 per cent emission reduction target or are they against it, Mr Speaker? Because the member for Maribyrnong says he's proud of a policy which 50 times he failed to explain during the last election campaign. Meanwhile, the member for Hindmarsh says they need an, a, a ruthless and unsparing review of those policies. Are they for coal? Or are they against coal, Mr Speaker? Because the Deputy Leader of the Opposition one moment was saying he wished the coal industry would come to an end and a moment later was saying he was tone deaf. And finally, are they for the big stick legislation, Mr Speaker, or are they against it? Mr Speaker, those opposite are all smear and no idea. The Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the person currently leading the McCormick government. <laughs> what is, he wanted me to say that. No, the, uh, the acting prime minister, Mr. Speaker. That's what is the government doing to ensure that journalism is not a crime? The acting prime minister has the call. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, as, a, as a former journalist of 21 years standing, 11, 11 as, a, as a daily newspaper editor, Mr. Speaker, uh, I of course uh, believe in the freedom of the press. The government is committed to the freedom of the press. Freedom of the press is central to our democracy, Mr. Speaker. Always has been, is now, always will be. Uh, it's also the government's first duty to keep Australians safe. That's first priority, Mr Speaker, and these considerations have to be carefully balanced, Mr Speaker. 
The government has asked the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security to inquire into the impact of the exercise of law enforcement and intelligence powers on the freedom of the press. And as the Attorney General has just said, we thought that that was bipartisan. At the committee's request, and as agreed by the Attorney General, the reporting date for this inquiry has been extended to 28 November. Now, the search warrants executed by the Australian Federal Police uh, to investigations under old laws that the Liberal Nationals government repealed and replaced with provisions that have strong protections for journalists. And as this matter is now before the courts, it would not be appropriate to comment further. But, Mr. Speaker, operational decisions are a matter, are a matter as they have to be for the AFP, and are made independent of executive government. That's the way it should be. Uh, the warrants were executed without the knowledge or the instigation of any government minister. Well done. The well done, member for Barker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Education. Will the Minister update the House on how our coalition government is providing stability and certainty to regional communities by delivering quality regional education, including to my electorate of Barker? The Minister for Education. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the member for Barker for his question. I know he's a passionate advocate for his electorate and for education, and in particular when it comes to regional study hubs. And it was wonderful to join him for the opening of the Barossa Regional Study Hub, and I know he's looking forward to opening another one next year. And we've also seen one at Murray Bridge open. So well done to the member for Barker, Mr. Speaker. We are providing record investment into higher education—$17.7 .7 billion this year, $18.2 billion next year, $18.8 billion the year after and $19.1 billion in 2022. And the reason we can do this is because we've got the budget back in balance. And can I congratulate the Treasurer for his announcement today? We're heading towards surplus. Well done, Treasurer. Not only are we providing record investment, but there are 1.5 million students now enrolled in higher education. Now, what we've got to make sure is that all Australians can access higher education. And, Mr. Speaker, recently I publicly released the National, Regional, Rural and Remote Tertiary Education Strategy, the Napthine Review. Seven recommendations, 33 key action items. And what this, what this strategy seeks to do is change the discrepancy between those in city areas who access higher education and those in regional and rural areas who access higher education. If you're born in the city, you're twice as likely to get a higher education degree than if you are born in a regional or rural areas. We have to address this. And the government has already begun addressing this. Since 2016, we have committed more than $500 million in new funding to improve regional higher education. This includes $39.2 million to establish 21 regional study hubs. We're also providing $53.9 million in income support to ease financial pressure on families. We've got support for regional students through the Rural and Regional yeah. Enterprise Scholarships yeah. and also $93.7 million for the Destination Australia program so that regional and rural Australians can capitalise on our international education market, a $35 billion market. We want to make sure that we can lift the attainment when it comes to regional and rural students. I know everyone is passionate about it on this side, and we want to improve it so we get better outcomes and results for country kids. The member for Ballarat. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. How many urban congestion fund projects have commenced construction since the fund was created in May last year? Members on both sides, the Minister for Urban Infrastructure has the call. I thank the member for Ballarat for her question. I can confirm that there are 130 major projects underway right now as we speak. And these are projects going on right around our great country. And this includes 
The North Connects includes West, West Connects, of course, includes the Monash Shop Parade. We're just about to get going on Tullamarine, the Tullamarine Rail out to the airport. The Minister might just try. It's only been 28 seconds. Yeah, I just, just. The Minister just takes a, takes a seat. I, there's not a time limit at which a point of order on relevance can be made, but he makes a a reasonable point, but I'll hear the member for Ballarat on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, on relevance. It was a very specific yes, question the about the member urban for congestion fund. Seat. The minister has the call. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, 130 projects. I was mentioning underway right now, and that's supporting 50,000 jobs. And if the member would like me to go, go through some of those projects. I'm happy to do so. The Pacific Highway, West Connects, the Northern Road, the Bruce Highway, the Northern Connector, Toowoomba Second Range Crossing, North Link, Toowoomba, the M80 Ring Road, the Monash, the Western Highway, etc. I could keep going all afternoon in relation to these projects, which we have underway right now. 50,000 jobs going on, and she asked me specifically in relation to the Urban Congestion Fund, and of course. Those projects form part of the 130 underway right now form part of our $100 billion infrastructure pipeline. And also part of that is our urban congestion fund, $3 billion to tackle those really congested pinch points in our suburbs to get and commuter car parks to ensure that people can get home sooner and safer. 166 projects which we have announced the minister since will before the election. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order other than relevance. Yes, Mr Speaker, tedious repetition. <laughs> the Leader of the Opposition the will resume zero, his seat. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition the Leader of the Opposition well knows that standing order does not apply to question time. He well knows that. And what it tends what it tends to lead to if it's repeated, is automatic ejection. That's what tends to happen. Because I find it tedious. The minister has the call. 166 smaller scale projects as well. Every single one, there is work underway, and the first ones will be under construction by Christmas of this year. And we expect the vast majority to get going within the next couple of years. Many of which we have already announced. Let me say, though, there is one project which is not underway. There is one very big project which is not underway, and the member for Ballarat knows this one absolutely intimately, and that is the East-West Link in Victoria. And this is a project, Mr Speaker, where we have $4 billion on the table, which is the entire government share required to get this project done. And what it would do, it, was, it would finally connect the Eastern oh, yeah. Freeway to the other side of Melbourne and support 80,000 commuters every single day who get stuck on the Eastern Freeway. And I asked the member for Ballarat, why won't she step up and put pressure on the Victorian government to get this project going? Because she's constantly saying she wants more infrastructure projects going. Well, this is one where we've got $4 billion ready to go, Mr Speaker. Why won't she pick up the phone to the Premier, her Labor counterpart, and say, get this project going? It would create thousands of jobs. It would support 80,000 motorists every single day and would support the economy of Victoria and Australia as well. The member for Mallee. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Water Resources, Drought, Rural Finance, Natural Disaster and Emergency Management. Will the Minister update the House on the Morrison-McCormack government's stable and secure approach to addressing water security? The Minister for Water Resources. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the member for Mali for her question and her deep understanding of the importance of water to sustain life and lifestyle in her own electorate and as we uh, work our way through one of the most severe droughts in our nation's history it's become more evident than ever the importance of leadership and investment in water infrastructure it's important to understand that it has never ever been the responsibility of a federal government to build a dam or a pipeline since federation since federation it has left. always been the ownership of the states they have enjoyed they have enjoyed the ownership 
of that resource. And sadly, over the last since 2003, we have only seen 20 dams built in this country. 16 of those have been in Tasmania because of the leadership of the Liberal government in Tasmania. More concerning, however, is that across particularly the eastern seaboard, we will see a 37 per cent reduction in storage capacity per person by 2030 unless there is leadership. And we, as a federal government, saw this in 2016 and started the National Water Initiative Fund. Oh, yeah. right. We put $800 million out and took that to $1.3 billion. Couple that with $2 billion from the Regional Investment Corporation, which those opposite voted against, I might add. And only, uh, only last week, the Deputy Prime Minister announced the National Water Grid. Because we, we needed to show the leadership to the nation that's required to build the water infrastructure to sustain life and lifestyle, not only in agriculture but in urban Australia. We had a critical junction and took leadership to stand up and to stand with the states and say it is time to act and deliver. Sadly, we saw Victoria today say we don't want to build a dam because we don't think it's ever going to rain again. Well, now is the time to build the infrastructure when it's dry. It's important that the leadership is shown, and I can advise the House, Mr Speaker, that after the discussions with the New South Wales government this week, that we will be working with them in partnership to prioritise a number of projects right across New South Wales to give security to regional New South Wales residents, those that are facing, facing critical water storage levels. And the Deputy Premier himself gave an undertaking that he is stands shoulder to shoulder with those communities to make sure they do not run out of water, but he has shown leadership with this federal government to say we will build the water infrastructure of the future, to future-proof the population growth, to future-proof our regional and economic growth. This is an important milestone in our nation's history that we now have leadership from states that are going to work shoulder to shoulder in sustaining this precious resource for our lifestyles and our lives. The member for Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister. Can he confirm that when in opposition the Coalition promised to build 100 dams and in government the member for New England promised dams just about everywhere, but in six years the government has not built one dam? Isn't this because the Deputy Prime Minister has been bullied out of building any dams by his senior coalition partner. The acting prime minister. Let me tell you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, let me tell for the member for Hunters. I don't get bullied by anyone. No one. Members on I'm my left. I'm not scared of you. I'm not scared of anyone, member for Hunter. And certainly, I'm actually pleased that I'm in a uh, coalition government where the Prime Minister actually also believes in building dams. And the Prime Ministers, the Liberal, the Liberal Prime Ministers, have always, always believed in building dams. And that's why we're getting on and we're going to build a dam. We're going to build a dam. And we're going to do it with the Queensland Government. But we're going to do it also, we're also going to do it with the irrigators Dep of the, the Acting Bill. Prime Minister will just pause. Members on my left will cease interjecting. No, they can just. Um, no, I haven't called you yet. The member for Hunter will contain himself, otherwise he'll be out of the chamber. No one can hear a word you're saying outside the chamber because I haven't called you. Your microphone's not on. The acting prime minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. So we are getting on, as in my earlier answer, we are getting on with building the water infrastructure to help further drought proof this nation, Mr Speaker. There will be shovels in the ground for the Emu Swamp Dam, uh, all things being equal, before year's end. And that is going to be a very special day. August 3 was a red letter day. You call it, could call it a blue letter day, Mr. Speaker, for water infrastructure in this nation, because that's the day Dr. Anthony Lynham, the minister responsible for water in Queensland, signed the dotted line after months of negotiation, after perhaps years of negotiation, to get the Emu Swamp Dam project 
ratified, Mr. Speaker, and I commend Brent Finlay. I commend him and his irrigation, irrigators uh, in that particular area for having the confidence to back themselves to the tune of $24.3 million. Mr. Speaker, pastoralists and pioneering river irrigators, Sir Samuel McCackie, of whom there is a statue uh, near Yanko. Mr. Speaker was correct when he said in 1909 that water was more precious than gold. Of course, he was right then, and it's still the case today. Water is our most precious resource, and that's why we're going to get on with the job of building dams. I was delighted that the CSIRO last year identified in three catchments the potential for six dam sites. We're going to get on and we're going to build the water infrastructure that Australia needs. I mean, when those opposite, when those opposite were in power, Mr. Speaker, and I remember when the member for Watson came to Griffith, Mr. Speaker, they burned, they burned the Murray-Darling Basin plan, the draft of the plan, Mr. Speaker. They were so aggravated with his water resource ideas, Mr. Speaker. They were so absolutely aggrieved with the position that he took. And if those opposite had it of one on May 18, Mr. Speaker, buybacks would have been back in mode. They would have, they would have sent most of the water for the, uh, of the Murray Darling, what little water there is, out of the mouth of the Murray, Mr. Speaker, because that is their policy. Well, we're not going to do that, and we're not also going to be deterred by the Victorian Water Minister, Lisa Neville, who said today, ruling out dams in the southern state, new dams do not create any new water. They simply take it from somewhere else. I ask those opposite, do they agree with that position, Mr Speaker? The member for Groom. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment. Will the Minister update the House on how the Morrison-McCormack government's stable and certain approach to protecting our natural environment is leading to better outcomes in rural and regional Australia. The Minister for the Environment. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the member for Groom from the great state of Queensland for his question in the House today. Congratulate him on his outstanding representation of the people in Toowoomba and the Range and recognise his interest in farmers and the environment working together. And it's interesting, Mr Speaker, and members on this side who represent rural Australia and walk many miles in the shoes of our constituents, managing so much of our land mass, we understand that it isn't about one versus the other. It isn't about conservation over here and farming over here, uh, threatened species over here and agriculture over here. It's about getting the balance right. It's about working together and coming back to the fact that we can't do it without our farmers who look after well over 60 per cent of Australia's land mass. And contrast that, people think of national parks, um, sometimes great places for feral animals, unfortunately, but they only amount to about 18 to 20 per cent of Australia. So it's rural Australians doing the heavy lifting and the hard yards, particularly in this time of drought. Now, I want to reassure everyone involved in environmental approvals that the statutory review of the EPBC Act is due to be announced next month. Uh, that happens every 10 years. And we believe on this side of the House it's an opportunity for real reform, clear and sensible reform around environmental approvals, because the Act is not really servicing too many people at the moment. It's taking too long to reach decisions. It's frustrating in terms of its process. It's subject to an enormous amount of litigation. And whether you land on the side of the argument that would like to see an approval go ahead or would like not to see an approval go ahead, you certainly want that decision to be made swiftly and efficiently, and that's what we're undertaking to do. We'll be announcing the review shortly. There'll be a lead reviewer. There'll be four panel members, one with expertise in agriculture, one in environmental law, one in indigenous land management. and. Um, another from our natural resource agency. So this is a really important review and I know everyone will want to have a say on it. Now yesterday, Mr Speaker, I wondered about the opposition's environment policy. I announced uh, or talked about one of our own, our community's environment policy, and I've been diligently searching through the paperwork to see if there's any more environment policies from members opposite, and I have found one. It's got a $50 million price tag attached to it. Is it about feral cats? Is it about exclusive exclusion fencing? Is it about threatened species? No, it's about $50 million to create a new Act of Parliament, a new Act, $50 million to create the Environment Protection Act. 
Well, I can tell members opposite that the work that we will be doing, the clear, sensible reform under the stability and certainty of this government, will not cost a single cent. The member for Bendigo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the acting prime minister. Can the acting prime minister confirm that the government has managed the delivery of the inland rail project so badly that it has alienated key support groups, including the New South Wales Farmers Association, AgForce, the Victorian Farmers Federation, Country Women's Association, and the National Farmers Federation? The acting prime minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I just wish. I just wish the member for Bendigo was a, perhaps a little more positive about the inland rail. Mr Speaker, this is going to be a transformational, nation-building, 1,700-kilometre corridor of commerce. It is going to, for the first time, get product from paddock to port within 24 hours. This is absolutely critical for rural, rural and regional Australia, and she and all the other rural and regional members on the Labor side, of, of whom there are not many, uh, Mr. Speaker, should get on board. In fact, every single member of the parliament uh, should get on board. I know these on, ours on our side are certainly, certainly in, in favour of inland rail, which reduces rail freight costs by up to $94 per tonne. Now, the inland rail, the business case, was originally predicated on a saving of $10 per tonne. And the CSIRO report uh, indicated that there could be potential savings of up to $94 a tonne on post-food production, but an average, av wait for this, an average saving of $76 per tonne. So $76 per tonne saving as opposed to $10 per tonne saving on the original business case. And, and I can vouch from my electorate, where the Parks to Narrow Mine section is, is rapidly underway, Mr. Speaker, how many jobs that has created in just that particular area. Now, yes, I understand that there are concerns. I, I appreciate that there are people uh, for whom the inland rail will have an impact, and that is why the Australian Rail Track Corporation is conducting community consultative committees. Uh, that's why I met with the Mayor of Gundawindi this morning on his concerns, Mr. Speaker. There are people who are concerned about the inland rail, but we. We don't live in a banana republic. Appreciate those opposite do build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. If you can remember that, you can use it. Members on my left. But Mr. Speaker, the inland rail is going to provide faster, safer, more reliable freight uh, efficiencies. Mr. Speaker, it's going to uh, even have a saving for the environment: 750,000 less tonnes of carbon and a third of the fuel of the road less. Mr. Speaker, this is improving our rail network. This is nation-building infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. It's, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, and you only have to look at some of the statistics. Uh, 480,000 cubic metres of ready-mix concrete. Uh, this, and, and, and I have to say that uh, on January 15 last year, when the uh, when the first shipment of steel was dropped off at Peak Hill, Mr. Speaker. The uh, ARTC and the proponents of the inland rail, including Ken Keith, the member of Parks, were absolutely delighted, absolutely thrilled that it was Wyala steel, Liberty steel, South Australian steel. That means Australian jobs. And many of those jobs, Mr Speaker, are union members. So I would have thought that those opposite would have got on board that, because these are Australian workers, Australian jobs, and it's for Australia's future. The member for uh, O'Connor has the call. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship, Migrant Services and Multicultural Affairs. Will the Minister update the House on how the Morrison McCormick government's stable and certain immigration policies are supporting regional communities to fill crucial skills and workforce shortages and to grow regional economies? Is the Minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Minister for Immigration. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you uh, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for his question. And it's a really good point that the member makes about the importance of stability and certainty, because stability and certainty, of course, is important across all government policies, but no more so in immigration, where it is so important that we have an orderly, stable and certain approach to immigration policy. Now, we run an immigration policy, Mr Speaker, which is sovereign, focused, and fair. 
unlike those opposite who presided over the worst public policy failure in Australia's post-war history when they completely lost control of our immigration system, Mr Speaker. The extraordinary and appalling humanitarian catastrophe that we saw uh, under uh, those opposite, Mr Speaker. Now, Mr Speaker, our immigration program reflects the fact that different parts of Australia have different needs. And in this year's uh, program, we've had the uh, lowest number in the uh, permanent migration uh, program uh, for the last decade, Mr Speaker. And that's to reflect the fact that we have seen significant population pressures, particularly uh, in Sydney and Melbourne. So we have reduced uh, the level of permanent uh, migration in our nation. And in the year to come, we'll see a further reduction, uh, Mr Speaker, as we further reduce the cap to 160,000. But within that, Mr Speaker, what we will see is an increased focus on regional Australia. And in fact, in the year that just ended, we saw a 44 per cent increase in the regional sponsored migration scheme that puts regional uh, employers together with skilled migrants. And this year, we've created 23,000 new visas for people who want to work hard, play by the rules, commit to regional Australia for at least three years, and then they'll be eligible for permanent residency, Mr Speaker. We've also created seven designated area migration agreements, or DAMA, DAMAs, yeah, yeah, yeah. including uh, with the, in the area of the member for O'Connor's uh, electorate uh, in the mining industry uh, and uh, in the member for uh, Wannan's yeah, yeah, electorate yeah. for the uh, dairy industry, where there are so many local uh, dairy uh, uh, families that do need support for the migration system to help them run their businesses so they can grow those businesses and support uh, more Australians, Deputy Speaker. We're also giving working holidaymakers an incentive to commit to regional Australia because they'll get an additional year on their visa if they do so. And the same with international students. If they commit to regional Australia, they'll get an additional year on their postgraduate visa as well. Now, these are all very important initiatives. They're about backing regional Australia, where migration is needed to help fill skills gaps, to help grow regional communities, and in our humanitarian program as well, Mr Speaker. We see that through great examples like the Yazidi community in uh, the Deputy Prime Minister's own electorate, which have added so much to our community. So across the board in our uh, migration program, Mr Speaker, we'll back regional Australia every step of the way. The Acting Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I ask further questions of the Morrison McCormack government to be placed on the notice plate. I thank the Acting Prime Minister. If members could just stay for a second. I've just got a couple of uh, short statements they'll be interested in. Um, the, James Rees, the current Secretary to the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, will complete his final day uh, at work on the 11th of October before we resume back here. James commenced his public sector career with the Government Department of Aviation in 1980. He is retiring after serving a long and dedicated career of 39 years in the public service, including the past 28 years here with the Department of the House of Representatives. Since commencing work at Parliament in the Bills and Papers Office in 1991, he has progressed through various roles, dividing his years of service almost equally uh, between various chamber support and committee support offices, with approximately 14 years in each. For those members who have not worked with James on committees, he would be known to you from his role as clerk at the table in the Federation Chamber, deputy clerk at the table here in the House Chamber. And I'm sure all members would like to join with me in thanking James and recognising his service uh, to the House, its members and committees, and wish him a very long, healthy retirement. And James is with us in the gallery today. <laughs> And on a completely unrelated topic, I just would like to remind members uh, that there are rules related to where images and vision are able to be captured within Parliament House, and indeed rules related to the use of photos and footage uh, that apply to all building occupants and their visitors. Uh, the media rules include a prohibition on photography and filming in the private areas of Parliament House, including but not limited to. Uh, the chambers and adjacent lobbies, security screening areas, uh, the staff and members' dining rooms, Aussies and the corridor and linkways and other private uh, corridor areas. These rules also prohibit the digital manipulation of photographs or footage of parliamentary proceedings and the use or republishing of these for 
political advertising. In reminding members, I also ask they remind their staff of these rules. I realise there is a natural predisposition for staff of parliamentarians to assume they can photograph, video and then publish whatever they want, but this isn't the case. There are indeed penalties for non-compliance with these rules, which include suspension of an individual's pass, and that penalty has been on, imposed on more than one occasion in the last 12 to 18 months. The media rules are available on the Parliament House website, and the link was emailed to members by the Sergeant-at-Arms on 23 July, but a hard copy of the media rules will also be distributed soon to all members. Any queries on where filming and photography can occur can be addressed to the Sergeant-at-Arms at any time. I thank members. The a leader of the House, is any papers? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, a document is tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honourable members earlier today, and full details of the document will be recorded in the votes and proceedings.